I'm very worried that we're misunderstanding what it is to be a human being. I'm an atheist and a humanist, and I'm rather relieved that for many of us, religious belief is on the retreat. The idea that we have a supernatural explanation of what we are is one that's not largely accepted. The trouble is people have moved to something that I regard as equally erroneous, which is what I call a naturalistic approach. The idea that essentially we're just part of nature like any other beasts. And it's that view that I wanted to critique. Very many things. There are obviously superficial things. People talk about language and tool use, institutions, sense of norms of right and wrong and so on. But beneath it is something much more profound, which is our self-awareness, our sustained self-consciousness, our sense of what and who we are in relation to others immediately around us, but in relation to a broader canvas of history and geography. The notion that consciousness boils down to brain activity I'm, doesn't persuade me at all. It's absolutely evident that we need brains, of course, for consciousness. If you chop my head off, I would be rather less conscious than I was before you chop my head off. And we know that brain injury can greatly interfere with normal consciousness, normal behavior, and so on. But that doesn't mean to say that consciousness itself is identical with the activity of the brain. The brain is an absolutely necessary condition of everyday consciousness, but it isn't the whole story. And we know it's not the whole story because if you look at the characteristic activity of the brain, so-called neural activity, activity of the nerves in the brain, it is quite different from the contents of consciousness. For example, if you look at what's going on in my visual cortex, which is my, that which is associated with vision, you'll see lots of nerve impulses. But they don't look at anything like the experience of green, the experience of blue, the sense of something looking far away and so on. Biologism has to be separated quite clearly from biology. Biology is a very good thing. As a doctor, I relied entirely on the wonderful biomedical sciences that made contemporary medicine possible. Biologism is the belief that we are entirely explained, or the best explanation of us, it comes from biology. And that therefore, if you really want to understand human beings, you look at them through evolutionary spectacles and you look them through them uh, using spectacles based on neuroscience, the idea that we're identical with our brains. I will put biologism in a bin, Neuromania, the idea that we are identical with brain activity and to understand human beings you need to look at their brains. And uh, Darwinitis, the idea that Darwin not only explains the origin of the human organism, your body and my body, which it most certainly does, but also that it explains people. Darwinitis, neuromania, they're for the bin as far as I'm concerned. What is not for the bin, of course, is Darwinian evolutionary theory or indeed neuroscience. Uh, and, and I think it's very important to make clear that I regard neuroscience as one of the great achievements of humanity, possibly the greatest achievement next to physics. Yeah. When did we become self-aware? What sort of creatures are self-aware? Are chimpanzees, for example, who are our nearest primate cousins, are they self-aware? Well, it appears they have little arias or spikes of self-awareness. For example, if you put a chimpanzee in front of a mirror and you put a little bit of lipstick on its forehead, it'll try and wipe the lipstick off its forehead. So it's aware that this body that it sees in the mirror is its own body. So that's a level of self-awareness. They also have little inklings of awareness of other selves. They have a little bit of theory of mind of other beasts, but they're again episodic. They have no sustained sense of themselves as what they are. So they don't have a sense of themselves as extended in time. They don't have a sense of a personal biographical future rooted in a personal biographical past. And that temporal depth, that depth in time, is essential for the sense of self. Uh, people have often said, if you don't think the mind is identical with brain activity, you must believe in dualism, you must believe the mind is a kind of ghost in the body. And I think that's equally bankrupt idea. At the moment, I don't think we have a good theory of where consciousness and mind fits into the material world. The universe is largely mindless. You and I are mindful. How does our mindfulness arise in a world of material objects that are entirely mindless? We don't have that answer. But so long as we know we haven't got that answer, we'll start, we'll continue to look.
If we think we've got the answer, we won't look and we'll basically be satisfied with what I believe are incorrect ways of seeing things. In any growing child, the sense of itself and the sense of the other are absolutely inseparable. My sense of being this person is very much bound up with my awareness of your awareness of me. So I think those two things are absolutely interwoven. And as our sense of self gets more enriched, so our sense of society gets more enriched. And these two ratchet each other up. So we self-conscious and other conscious creatures get more and more self-conscious and more and more other conscious. And our sense of self is permeated by a sense of others. I mean, if I feel ashamed of myself, it's not a private feeling. It's, an, um, it's my sense of what others will think of me. Even when I'm thinking to myself, I'm using language that everybody else uses. When I'm trying to make sense of who is Raymond Tallis, I use the language of the collective, the language of the community. So, I mean, there's been some studies that have claimed to, to explain love as simply the activity in a particular part of the brain and have explained it entirely biologically. But human love is much more complex. Human love is about a self relating to other selves. The great German philosopher Hegel put his finger on it. He said, all animals, including the human animal, are, have appetites that are satisfied by food, water, and so on and so forth. There is one animal that has an appetite that's satisfied only by the consciousness of its fellows, and that's the human animal. And that's why we need love. We want to be acknowledged by others. We want to be valued by others. And that's quite different from wanting to eat or drink or even to copulate as animals, other animals do. The desire to be loved, to be acknowledged by others, to feel that you are valued is absolutely fundamental in human beings. I'm not too sure that I could, under, could see, understand the equation of God and consciousness. Because first of all, there are lots of consciousnesses. There's your consciousness and my consciousness. So is God distributed around. And why go for God? Because God is a rather, to me, rather baggy concept. It's got a lot of historical accretions. And even when you strip off those historical accretions and try and narrow down the idea of God to a set of concepts, you usually end up with self-contradictory concepts. And when the person in the audience spoke, I set out some of the contradictions in the idea of God. So I didn't think that I'm very attracted to the notion of replacing the idea of consciousness with the idea of God or identifying consciousness and God. I'm sure some conscious people feel they are God, but that's not the same thing. The book I was mainly focusing on today was Aping Mankind, Neuromania, Darwinitis and the Misrepresentation of Humanity. And that came out in paperback last year. If you count the number of thoughts in the book, you won't, you, you'll stop thinking about the price because it's an absolute bargain, yeah. Well, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. First of all, the reputation of the Lunar Society. I mean, I've read Jenny Uglow's book about the Lunar Men, and so uh, I, I, you know, the very fact there's this great heritage behind it's fantastic. I have a personal relationship with Peter Mayer, who is a colleague in medicine whom I admire a lot. And also, I, I love Birmingham. I, was, I came to Birmingham as a very junior doctor in the 1970s or the 1870s, I'm not too sure. And so I have an affiliation with Birmingham. And it's such a, it's a city I love being in, uh, you know. So given half a chance, I break into a trot and come here.